And again, I do not get offended by anything. So ask away, don't be shy, this is your turn. Go ahead. Why don't we eat pork? Great question. First answer to that, and the clear answer is because Allah forbid it in the Quran. Right? As we said, we as Muslims, we submit ourselves to our Creator. So if my Creator feels that pigs are not meant to be eaten, then He knows better than me. Right? So it's forbidden in the Quran. Now, some of the benefits of not eating pork, I already told you the why, but some of the benefits, it is the filthiest meat. If you take health, as I did at this college, uh, we did an experiment, we put different types of meat out. The first one that rotted with maggots and all kinds of nasty things was pork. In fact, if you look at scientific studies, there are bacteria in, in, in bacon and, and pork that can't even be killed through cooking. There's a man in San Diego, you can Google it. He got a worm in his brain from eating a pork taco in Tijuana. So, there are many harms to eating. Not every animal is meant for consumption. And, and, and we, we don't eat pork, we also don't eat other animals, some that are a part of the cycle of life, like carnivores, like lions and tigers. Those have been forbidden for us. So we, as well as the earlier traditions, if we look at the Judaic tradition in Judaism, you also are not supposed to eat pork. In fact, if you look at the early Christians, they also didn't eat pork because Jesus said he didn't come to do away with the law, the earlier law, but to rectify it. So the dietary requirements of the Old Testament were applicable for Christians as well. So technically, Muslims, Jews, and Christians, none of us should eat pork. Now, Christians may eat pork today, but we don't. We'll stick to it. All right. Get turkey bacon if you're really in the mood for it. Questions, please. Yes. Excellent. Great question. The Qur'an was revealed, not written. Meaning that Allah, He revealed His words to Jibril, Gabriel, who revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be That's our belief. And we do not believe that anybody came up with the Qur'an. It was a direct revelation. Now, copies of the Qur'an were written during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by his companions. They were memorized. And there are many people today who have memorized the whole Qur'an. We have people here with us that have memorized cover to cover, letter to letter, word by word, right? In every Ramadan, in the fasting month, we have people that lead the prayers and they recite the whole Qur'an from memory in almost every mosque, right? And that's one of the miracles of the Qur'an. For example, um, how many of you know of a man called the Pope? All right, good. At least, just making sure you guys know. You can never heard of the Pope? Come on, raise your hands, right? Has he memorized the Bible? No. What about, was it uh, Jimmy Swaggart? I don't know, name a, name a, <laughs> okay, you know who he is. <laughs> um, huh? Dalai Lama, memorize the Bible? I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you look at any of the Christian ministers or preachers that are famous or Catholic or, I don't know personally, a single one that's memorized the Bible letter by letter, word by word. They may have a few pastor, passages from here and there. And that shows one of the miracles of the Quran, and why is that important? Because if you look at the Bible today, the New Testament, right? There are so many different versions of it, right? The Catholic Bible has different numbers of books than the Protestant Bible, right? So that means there are certain books in the Catholic Bible that Christians don't accept. And amongst Catholics, there are books that they don't accept, right? So that means, where's the original Bible, right? If we look at most of the biblical works in English today. They will be based off the King James Version. Any of you know who King James was? You do? Right, I'm glad somebody does, right? King James was known as the Queen of England. You can Google why. He was pretty <laughs> friendly with animals in ways I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to be friendly with animals in. Look it up. It's not my opinion. Look it up. King James. Look up his history, look up what he, how he lived, the four men that he had long-standing relationships with, let alone the others. So, how does a man like that bring to you your Bible? Right? Who gave him the authority to edit the Bible, or translate, or mess with? Right? So, the Bible today, even if you look at the four books, the famous Matthew, Luke, John, Mark, right? If you look at them, who authored them? We don't know. Google it. It wasn't the apostles. 
It was about 70 to 100 years after the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, that these books were written. And most biblical scholars will tell you the authorship is unknown. Right? But that's the difference in the Qur'an. The Qur'an was preserved during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. It was written out and memorized. The first caliph, Abu Bakr, put it together in a book. Uthman III, he standardized, sent out prints. We still have those. We still have those copies. Google them, you can see pictures. Right? And on top of that, there are thousands who memorize the whole Qur'an cover to cover from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then every generation, millions have memorized, till today, millions across the Muslim world have memorized the whole Qur'an. So if there is a print error, we catch it the other way. If somebody makes a mistake, we have the print. So this preserves the message. Today, if you go to a Catholic church, what is one of the first things you'll notice when you walk in? Big statues, right? Saints, right? I don't know. Have Saint you ever been? Glass windows. Glass windows with images. Beautiful images. Beautiful images. What's the first commandment? Come on, you know the Ten Commandments. What? Keep going. Hmm? Keep going. Th that's the intro. Oh, second commandment. All right. Second commandment. What is it? So would a statue not be a graven image? So you walk in and you see these beautifully made statues, but it's against the second commandment. Right? If you look at, and I, I've been to many a Catholic churches, I've, you know, you, you go and, and there's a place, uh, I don't know, uh, it's been a while. Uh, I don't know, it's called communion maybe? What's it called when you sit down, you kind of open your mouth and the priest comes and, uh, what is it called? Anybody know? Communion. communion. All right. So what do you do? You sit down on a, on a bench and you open your mouth and he puts a cracker. A wafer. A wafer, thank you. Uh, which is, symbolizes the flesh of Christ. And then some people get wine as symbol of the blood of Christ, right? Very rare. Very rare. Okay. So, now, can we find that in the Bible? That actual worship. Did Jesus actually tell people to lean in front of them, for example? Or confession? Well, or just the Last Supper. Sure. Do this in memory. Excellent. So in the Last Supper, did people line up and open their mouth and he gave them yeah, paper? No, they just ate together. They just ate together. Okay, so that's different. Mm -hmm. I love to just sit down and eat, no problem. But in Islam, when we worship, even how we stand, how we bow, how we prostrate, which way we face, all of that, I can find you exactly from the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that's the difference. Because we do not innovate in the religion. We stick to what is recorded because it's been preserved. If you look at the worship rites of Muslims around the world, Indonesia, Malaysia, Russia, America, you see the five-time prayers, the same prayers. You see fasting Ramadan, face Ramadan. Eid, Eid. You see all of the same things. Why? Because those have been preserved in that manner. So... Long answer to your very uh, short question, but it's a very important question. The Qur'an was not written by anybody. It was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, and then it was preserved through memory and writings by the companions until our time. More questions? Go ahead. That's a... Interesting question. <laughs> so, does it have the same stance of the Bible? I'm not a biblical scholar. I've studied it, I've read it cover to cover, I've been through a lot of biblical studies, but I'm not going to claim to speak on behalf of the Bible. So, what is the stance of the Bible? I will let anybody who represents that faith tell you. Um, if the stance is to condemn the act of homosexuality, then yes. Uh, the Qur'an does not accept the act of homosexuality. Some people may have leanings or feelings, uh, but it is seen as something that is against the natural way that God created us. Does it say so in the Quran? I'm sorry. Yes. So in the Quran, we have uh, verses about the people of Lut, Lot, as Sodom and Gomorrah, as you have in the Bible as well, and that they were destroyed because of such an action that they did, which was male. Yes. And then the Prophet Muhammad peace explained it as well. And I mean, like I said, um, people have different inclinations. We don't deny that. Somebody may be attracted to children, but we may find that offensive, right? Somebody may say, why? It's my choice. I'm attracted to children. And we may say as a society, I'll, I'll get to you in just a second. Let me just finish. 
I don't want you to get your hand tired. Um, trust me, anybody has questions, I'll stay all night. We're going to get through this. So, uh, if we look at attraction to animals, for example, or attraction to other things, we as society make those judgments. Meaning, in the 40s and 50s and 60s and maybe, I don't know, 70s, in America, it was not okay. And then a time came that we as a society decided that it is okay for men to marry men or women to marry women. And that's something we as a community or as a country make laws and legislate for. As religious laws go, if we go to the religious traditions of almost every religion that I have studied, and I've not studied all of them, you will not find acceptance for homosexuality. Not in the Hindu traditions, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. Now, some Christian preachers or Jewish rabbis or maybe even imams may change their stance, and that's their personal view. But in the religious traditions of all religions, you will find that it's not an acceptable practice. Right? Now, if you look at a lot of the ideas that are natural human methods. I mean, let me give you an example. Any species, right, whether it's an animal, what is one of the core responsibilities of that species is to further the species, right? They want to have more, whether they're ducklings or children or spawn, to continue that going. Unless we get into a lot of scientific uh, test tube methods, if the whole world went towards a homosexual attitude, how would that happen for humanity? You see? I'm not saying that people don't have certain different feelings. People do. But to act on those feelings is where laws and religion and things come into practice. I may have a bad temper. I may be genetically born with a bad temper, and I probably am. <laughs> but I cannot act upon it. If I act out that act of violence, then I'll be arrested for it. Right? That is the laws of society. Somebody may be attracted to animals. That may be a part of their personality. But if they act that out so far in our country, they'll be arrested for it unless you're in Arkansas or something. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No offense to anybody from Arkansas, just kidding. Okay. So... Sure. I mean, as a parent, you want to engage your children, right? So if they have certain inclinations, whether it is towards homosexuality or whether it is to bestiality or anything else that you as a Muslim parent don't find accepting, it is your responsibility to have that communication with your child. You may tell your child that, look, you know, there are, there are things that you may feel that you shouldn't act upon because that acting upon is not acceptable to your moral code. And that is a, a relationship between a parent and a child that you should develop from a childhood, that your child should be comfortable enough to come to you and say, hey, you know what, I feel like beating up this next door neighbor. And you tell them, you know, you may have those feelings, but you know, you have to control those feelings, you have to deal with them, because to act out that action is not acceptable to you. So, um, here in not Sure. And I didn't suggest that they should be. Through communication, right? It, it, sure. Right. No, and that's why I said uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that somebody has to be arrested for it. There are punishments for different crimes in Islam, but let's talk about. Uh, let me give you another example to make sense here. For example, uh, drinking alcohol is forbidden in Islam, but in the United States, if you're over the age of 21, 18 or 21 still, all right. Somehow. When you turn 21, it's okay. So, and when you're 20 and a half, you still are not mature enough. Uh, so, here you're allowed to drink. So, let's say a Muslim parent finds their child drinking alcohol. Well, you're going to have the same communication. It doesn't mean you're going to necessarily get them arrested or cut off their hands or something like this. But you need to have that relationship with your child that you can say, look, you know, I understand that your friends are drinking. I understand that you may want to go and party and go to San Diego State and get drunk. But... This is not acceptable in our moral code. And your only option is that communication. That's all you have in this country or anywhere else in the world. Because very few, except Texas had a sodomy law, but very few countries even in the world, some countries in Africa currently, will really go and find somebody who's gay and arrest them. Right? Meaning even if you go to Saudi Arabia or those countries, 
that's not really the way you deal with a problem. Any of those kind of things, whether it's alcoholism or homosexuality or anything else that's not acceptable to you, even if you're a Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or whatever, your only tool is communication. That's what you have. Right. Or you can show them those 50s videos. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Questions? Go ahead. Good question. Uh, do I believe in the restoration of a caliphate in the Middle East? Um, if you mean by that the current situation with ISIS, then I do not. <laughs> All right. If you mean that as a Muslim, do I believe there will be a time when there will be a caliph who will bring peace on earth, then yes. This has been prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now. Uh, if you look at the Christian traditions, for example, you have the rapture, right? Where all the believers get taken up. And many people have prematurely stated the rapture is here, right? Many Christians. And just because you believe as a Christian that there will be a rapture, doesn't mean that everybody who professes it, you agree with them, right? So I do believe as a Muslim that there will be a time where you'll have a caliphate, but not in what you see with ISIS or Al-Qaeda or any of that kind of stuff, right? Uh, I do not believe in what they are progressing. I believe they are misusing religious uh, texts to take advantage for political cause, as we find in Jamestown. I don't know if you know about Jamestown. I think there's a movie coming out about it. So maybe you'll hear about it, the people that drank the Kool-Aid and killed themselves. Uh, so, so those things, are, those are people that misuse religion for whatever personal ambitions or political cause they have. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, how do you feel about the separation of religion and government? Excellent question. In Islam, we don't have this concept of separation between church and state. Right? Because an American Muslim. Well, so I'm getting there. So at, in Islam, we don't have this concept of separation between church and state. Meaning Islam is a complete way of life. So we have governing laws in the Quran, we have, and, and that's not, okay, so let, let's, let's, uh, let me explain. For example, have you ever heard of a country called Israel? I've been there twice. In Israel, the government is run by Jewish law. It is a part of their governance to use religious law. In other countries, that's true as well, even in the United States. In the United States, many of our laws are based on Judeo-Christian thought. Whether we say it's from the Bible directly or not is a different issue. And you can talk to some of our right-wing guys and they'll explain it to you about you know, you know, why the Ten Commandments should be in the courtroom and all that kind of stuff. So in Islam we do believe that God has sent us the best divine laws to rule by, to have justice by, and to live by. That's our belief. Now in the United States, we as citizens of the United States, we profess there to be a separation between church and state, and we as Muslims respect that. Even though I would say that sometimes we don't see it as much as we profess it, meaning we believe in the separation between church and state, right? But if a Mormon wants to have a second wife, based on his religious faith, it's illegal for him. So, so you see what I'm saying? So, so there is a gray area even in this country, right? Let's say, for example, I am from an African or Amazonian tribe, and I believe in walking around in nothing but my birthday suit. Can I? I cannot. I will be arrested for indecent exposure. So that means we have our own moral codes and ideas, and under God we trust, and you know, we see uh, official celebrations of church. Uh, for example, Trump is celebrating Christmas, but we don't see him celebrating Diwali or Eid or many other religious traditions, right? So that means, even in America, let's not, let's not fool ourselves, right? There is an overlap between religion and government. Other countries like Israel are very open about it. In Islam, we believe the best laws are the laws of Allah. But if we live in a country, as we do in the United States, where there is that separation, we respect that. Okay, I was saying that. Good. Are you an atheist, really? Right. But, but isn't it hypocritical 
if we say, for example, we don't want to have a Ramadan dinner in the White House, but then we have a big Christmas tree and we have big... Okay, good. We agree to there. Right, e email, email uh, Trump at White House. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> no. well, he tweets, right? <laughs> Maybe he has somebody else to, and I, nobody else could tweet that bad. Well, I, I mean, I will agree that if that is the that is the context of the Bill of Rights or whatever, you know, the Constitution, whatever, that we will have that separation, then we should really have a separation. It shouldn't be hypo hypocritical. Whether that is really the intent of the Constitution or not, I'll let you argue it out with the right-wing guys. I'm not in that argument, right? But I will agree with you that if that is the context then, then it should be. We shouldn't say one thing and do something else. All right? But I have a question for you, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. Okay. Are you really an atheist? Absolutely. Okay. Agnostic atheist. All right. Uh, so agnostic, I mean, from what I understand, and I'm, I'm asking with the open heart, I'm not, this is not a loaded question, right? I believe agnostic means that you do believe there is a God, but you just don't know exactly what he or she is. Okay. All right, good. Okay. Okay. I want to ask you a sincere question, and all I ask is a sincere answer. We good? All right. This room. Have you been here before? That's not the question, by the way. <laughs> all right. If I was to tell you that there were no engineers who planned out this room, there were no electricians that put in those lights. That that projector, this screen, that laptop, my backpack, these chairs, these tables, those walls, that exit sign, the clock, over billions of years, grains of sand themselves made this room exactly the way it is. Would you believe me? It's just a question, yes or no? It's a strong answer, so I will not dignify that with an answer. All right, so... The, the strong man is that right. grains of sand can't do that. All right, so... The more complex answer is that that's not how it happened. So that's not... Wh why is that not how it happened? It could have happened in any number of ways. That sure. Have or maybe we don't know yet the way that it happened. So would you sincerely tell me that you don't know how this room was built? That there were no engineers. All right. So if I was to tell you that nobody built this, that grains of sand did come together, would you believe that or not? That's my question. Yeah. Thank you. Next. Um, maybe I don't know what he means when he says. All right. That's why I asked. Maybe. I, well, is it like he don't believe in anything at all? He would probably be better to answer that question. Yeah. So, sure, sure. So, I, I, from what I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not an atheist, nor do I claim to be an expert on atheism, that's why I asked you the difference, um, is the belief, or, or the lack of belief in God, right? Where you don't believe in God. I mean, it's a belief thing, right? It's not a religion. So an atheist, God. Right. All right. All right. So my question, and, and again, it was not for an argument, but just for a yes or no basic question, is because as a, and I'm not speaking as a Muslim, I'm just speaking as a logical human being who studied enough of the human body not to have a degree in science, but to know that it's much more complicated than this room. The eye, the ears, the nose, the liver, the lung, heart, 
and the way it works, oxygen and carbon dioxide and the cycle and the atmosphere is definitely something better designed, more complex than this room. So if I as a person couldn't believe that this room in its minor perfection could be by itself, then it would be very hard for me, I'm not pushing my belief on you, I'm saying for me, it would be very hard to believe that the human and, and the cycle of, and, and the miracle of life and the planet that we live in and the stars and atmosphere and everything else came into existence by itself. My belief, I respect your right to have yours. Question? Come on, the hard ones. This has all been easy. Come on, or the Fox News stuff, come on. There you go. Don't hold back, let it go, man. Open up. That's what it is today. <laughs> uh, all right, that's a political question, not a religious question, but I will answer it anyway. Uh, if Israel goes to a one-state solution as it is currently, um, as, as a human being, let alone as a Muslim, uh, I don't believe that would be a good thing for humanity. Let me explain why. Biblical rights to a land are very hard to prove, right? Because if you say the land of Israel was promised to Moses, then as Muslims we would say he was a Muslim, and that's why it was promised to Muslims. And as a Jew you may say that he was a Jew, and it was promised to the Hebrew people. As a Christian you may feel that this land of Christ should be a homeland for Christians, and then have some things they call the Crusades, right? So if you go back to that context, then it's going to be no solution then it's just whoever can beat whoever, right? But if you go to a law perspective, there was a people living in what is today Israel, or was known as Palestine, before the creation of the state of Israel, and, and, peop and there was a horrible war in Germany, or in, or in Europe, called World War II, and afterwards they decided to give a homeland to the Jewish people who were butchered and, and killed by Hitler in Germany, and they took a land called Palestine, and, and as a UN body would, through a war, the Zionists had the Six-Day War, they took it. Well, that's not right, because if you, for example, where are you from originally? Uh, yeah. Vietnam. Let's say I live in Vietnam, and I am of the Cham people. And let's say you oppress me, right? You do some horrible, you put me in concentration camps and kill me. And I say, you know what, this person has done this horrible deed to me, I want a homeland, San Diego is mine. Right? And I come to San Diego and I, I take over San Diego. Well, the people of San Diego would ask, well, we didn't do anything to you. So the people of Palestine, the Arabs and other Jews and Christians that were living there, they didn't do anything to the people that were in Europe. So if they wanted to give a homeland, why didn't they cut a piece of Germany and give it to them? Right? But to take away a people's land and then the 1948 and then later on more and more into Gaza and, and through military strength basically take over and occupy a people's land and imprison them in their own land, uh, I believe is not correct. I believe a, a solution through dialogue and giving people back the right to their land um, is where the solution lies. If you go to Jordan, you will find that the country is about 5 million, 4 million are Palestinian refugees that will never be able to, or so far, will never be able to return to their own homes. Right? Do I think that's correct? No. I'm honest, sorry, if anybody gets offended. Questions? Yes. I'm sorry? Good question. Um, Arabs are not all Muslims, and not all Muslims are Arabs. So as an ethnicity, there is no necessarily, there's no tie. There are many Arab Christians, Arab Jews, Arab atheists, Arab whatever else, right? Um, and, and the majority of the Muslim world, maybe about 80, 85% is not Arab. Right? Most of the Muslim world does not speak Arabic. But the religion of Islam is tied in with the language. Why? Because the Quran was revealed in the Arabic language. So the Quran is in Arabic. Right? So you can translate the meanings of the Quran, but the real Quran will always be in Arabic. So Muslim scholars always study Arabic, in classic Arabic, not spoken Arabic. 
so they can learn and understand and explain the Quran in its original language. Okay? Do you have to learn Arabic to be a Muslim? No. Do you, if, is it necessary that if you know Arabic you're going to be a Muslim? No. But there is that tie between Arabic and, and Islam because that's a language that the Quran was revealed in. Good. Interesting. Good. I'm glad people are learning. Questions, please. Something that's been bothering you about Muslims and you just wanted to say, if I ever see one of them Muslims. <laughs> Anything. We all good? All questions answered? Everything clear? The world is hunky-dory now? <laughs> all right. Um, if you do have questions later, please feel free to contact me. Um, you can get my contact information. Uh, also, if you'd like, uh, we have the Quran. Uh, we have other books free of charge. You can you feel free to take them, read them. If you have any questions about anything that was in the presentation, um, I've sent it to Mukarram from the One Message Foundation. So he has a copy. He can forward it to you, and you can look up the you know, articles. I've given the links there, or the verses from the Bible or the Quran. Uh, if you ever have any questions about Islam, you're more than welcome to come and ask. You can go to any mosque. Uh, we do not have like a particular mosque that you have to go to. Any mosque you can go to. Uh, we, I personally go to the mosque that is around 70th Street in La Mesa. So we have dinner every Thursday, open to the community, Muslim, non-Muslim. You're welcome, free of charge. Break some bread, eat some food. And you know, you can see we have no secret rooms with bombs or anything like that. Um, so you're welcome. And uh, if you have any other questions or comments, I'm here. All right? Thank you. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا